I don't like making these predictions because both people like you and I get beaten up over the head with it and said, why didn't it happen? Yes, you said right. it. I made, I, yes, yes. I, I, I've made a lot of wrong predictions, which is why I want you to be wrong as well. Misery loves misery loves company, Ralph. So as long as people but accept I that I am going to be 100% wrong... Welcome to Wealthy On and Speak Up, and thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Anthony Scaramucci. Before we start, I want to remind you that our mission at Wealthy On is to help investors achieve their financial goals. We say become financially resilient, uh, resilient in other ways in life, of course, as well. But financially resilient is the motto for Wealthy On. So if you're interested in some expert guidance, go to WealthyOn.com for a free no-obligation consultation with one of our fully vetted registered investment advisors. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe and share our shows. Remember, Wealthy On is a conversation with you, our vibrant community. So keep the feedback coming. We want to hear what you have to say. And now let's dive into the show. I've got a great guest this week, a dear friend, Raul Paul. He is an author and an expert on many topics, macro, crypto, Web3, and more. Raul Paul of Real Vision, welcome to Speak Up. It's good to see you, my friend. We're both in the tropics today, so we can gloat. Yeah. Well, I, I'm wearing my, um, you know, I don't know what this is. I think it's called a lay. You like that? Because you know you like that You've word. Got the necklace, like that word. I've got the bracelet. Right. The so, so, yes, I'm here in Hawaii. So I want everybody, every Speak Up viewer to eat their hearts out. I'm here in Hawaii. Uh, and you're also, you're obviously on Grand Cayman or Little Cayman. I, I came over from Little Cayman yesterday. I was there for a week. I've just come over to Grand Cayman. Because, you know, you've got to live between two small Caribbean islands. And, amen. And you, and, and by the way, and you deserve to live there because you've been right about so many different things. Uh, the first time I talked to you, by the way, about this, obviously we go back three decades to Goldman Sachs, uh, where we both share time there. The first time I talked to you about all things Web3, Bitcoin, crypto, was November of 2020. Uh, and I had just taken a position in Bitcoin. Uh, this is before my Ethereum and Solana positions. And you were explaining this stuff to me. And so we, before we go into where you are today, I want to go back. I want to go back to the day where the rock hit you in the head. And you said, wait a minute, I've got to be a part of this. Because, Raul, you're a traditional finance guy, as am I. But yet you saw something and you were brave enough to make the transition. Tell our viewers and listeners what that was. So my moment happened. So I, I'd left Goldman. I was running a hedge fund. I'd left the hedge fund, opted out of the rat race, moved to Spain. I was writing macroeconomic research, Global Macro Investor, which I still write. And I was writing and predicted the financial, uh, the financial crisis and then the European crisis that came just after. I'm living in Spain. The banks are defaulting. They're going bust. They're taking people's money out of their accounts and saying, it's not your money anymore. I'm seeing what happened at Lehman Brothers where nobody knows who owns what when a bank goes under. And I'm like, this is a huge problem. So I thought, maybe I can try and create the world's safest bank. So I went around the world with a bunch of family offices trying to start a bank. And we got stopped by the Dallas Fed. They said, you can't do a non-fractional reserve bank because you'll take all the deposits from the system. So we're just not going to allow it. But it's a good idea. I'm like, so a friend of mine, and I think you probably know him as well, Emil Woods and Chad Cascarilla. Sure. Yeah. They were Global Macro Investor subscribers. They said, take a look at Bitcoin. I'd kind of hit my radar screen in like 2011. But 2012, I, I went down the rabbit hole and realized, actually, this was an asset that you can own outside of the financial system that has value and the blockchain rails could everything in finance could be built upon them. That was my first idea. And so I wrote the first ever macro strategy piece about Bitcoin, I think ever written back in March, 2013. And I bought Bitcoin at $200 and then I've been in it ever since. And even when we started Real Vision, which is the kind of financial knowledge platform, the first video we ever did in 2014 had Bitcoin in it. We've taken as many people as possible on this journey to say, listen, crypto is really important. You just don't understand it yet. But everyone will find their way in 
in how important it's going to be for a future financial system. Well, you mentioned Chad, so I'm going to talk a little bit about him. Uh, I had dinner with him last week in Miami. Uh, Chad was an early, early OG sort of a Bitcoiner. He was mining Bitcoin under $100 a coin, and he saw something that you're explaining, and I'll, I'll, I'll just throw in a few Chad quotes. He was like, this is an electronic data system that can tabulate and keep track of the world's wealth fully distributed, fully transparent, and it's hard, so it can't be manipulated. And one of the things that you and I have seen over the course of our career is that we do get the money from a third party because uh, people generally don't like and don't trust each other, and so they need a third party to validate things for them. Uh, but what we have found over 5,000 years is that third party uh, has a tendency to corrupt the money, corrupt the tabulation of wealth, by inflating the system. Of course, we had Lynn Alden, a friend of yours and, and mine last week on the show, talking about broken money. So so before I switch over to macro, Raul, why is this so important? Why, why, why would this be so important to an individual, a high net worth individual, a middle class individual? Why would this sort of tabulation yeah. software system be so important? So I'm going to give... Two levels. The first, the very, very big picture level is the world is awash with debt. Global debt is 400% of global GDP. It, these are bananas numbers. So what does that mean? We talk about debt a lot. What it means really is the collateral, the assets that back the system have lots and lots of people claiming on them. So if anything goes wrong, you get a fraction of your money back. Also, we're learning that banks are now bailing in creditors. So you find that the issue in the leverage world is you actually don't think, whatever you think you own, you don't actually own. It can be taken away from you. That's the real issue we're trying to solve here at a very top level, is how do I keep that recorded ownership of what is mine and what is yours? And don't pollute them because some third party uses them for their own means. And then before you know it, nobody knows anything. But the other big change was obviously the internet. So if, when I got into this journey, the internet was around, but it wasn't the scale of what it is now. We're now creating these global nation states that are digital, that operate outside of the US or the UK or Europe. And they need a system of, as we get more digital, each day our lives get more digital. Digital assets now have value. This digital infrastructure is much more efficient at moving stuff around and recording the ownership. So if we now go to this system where in the United States you buy a house and it gets stamped and go to a notary and then it get recorded in a registrar, this can be instantaneous, everywhere and nowhere, and always verifiable. So it, it's really the operating system for the digital age. And without it, it kind of doesn't function. It's all a bit clunky. But with this, it's instantaneous settlement, recorded ownership, and transfer of everything. Yeah, see, I mean, it, this, is, this is where you, you got, got me uh, with the bug three and a half years ago. I looked at Bitcoin. I have to confess this to people. And I didn't understand it. And I thought, okay, wait a minute. This is just a cryptographic code on the internet. Why would somebody pay $42,000 for that? And then it dawned on me what you're saying. that This is actually a broad-based tabulation system. And if you think about what money actually is, well, it's a broad-based tabulation system. We're using this technology known as money so that we can transact with each other without bartering. Uh, but... You and I both know, unfortunately, because of our debt-laden societies, the money gets corrupted by central banks and it gets corrupted by, by politicians. Uh, we were told by Jerome Powell last week in a 60 Minutes interview, you know, we, we're going to have debt for as far as the eye can see. There's a fiscal crisis coming to the United States unless politicians are going to intervene and become less reckless with their spending. And so I want to shift gears. Well, hold on. I, want to, I want to go back to one point before we do. Yeah, go ahead, please. another layer please. on this, which was this thing that happened to both of us really three years ago, which was Ethereum. It's like, what is this smart contract business? 
So I want people to understand that everything humans do is basically a contract. All societies are organized by contracts. Me appearing with you was a contract over email. Um, even how societies work, how religions work, everything, they're contracts. Some are, some are not that important. Like meeting a friend for a drink, you can say, hey, listen, I can't make it. Nobody's going to sue you for it. It might cost you more drinks next time, but, you know, that kind of thing. But others are really important. Insurance contracts, derivative contracts, contracts for ownership of property. All of this can now be digital so you don't have to trust a third party. So now we're away from the system of money. We're now talking about verified truth, electronically verifiable truth done by code. So that means we can then get rid of middlemen all over the place. And we've all spent too much money on lawyers. We've all spent too much money on accountants. We've all spent money with notaries. All of this stuff disappears. Things like insurance companies don't need to be insurance companies anymore. They're just contracts of payments and contracts for pooling of capital. So it can be in literally anything from a ticket to a sports event to the most complex derivative contract in the world can actually go on this new rails. So it's much bigger than we either of us first thought when we first saw it. It's like, yeah, no, oh, wow, no it's question. everything. Yeah, no, no question. And we'll get we'll get we'll get to Solana as well. So so tie that in for us to the current macro situation because you and I both know what we're talking about is still quite small in the global economy. The market capitalization of all of these cryptocurrencies, perhaps $1.7 trillion, again, based on market prices. Bitcoin is uh, roughly half that at about $850 billion uh, US dollars, closing in on a trillion. But I guess, I guess the question I have is, what is happening in the world uh, that has you so confident that this will rise uh, so it's a- for everybody? And mainstream, Raul, it will mainstream. So it's kind of at three levels. Firstly, people understand that the system is broken and they're looking for answers. Some people choose gold. Some people choose Bitcoin. People use different ways of of getting around this. They can feel it. It's all around you. You can see it with populism. You can see it with just how markets react. So there's this feeling that I need to find an answer here. A lot of that is being driven by We know there's all this debt and I'm scared of it. Okay, that's good. The other thing is, what is the answer that the central banks chose or the governments? It was create more money. So you've got this macro backdrop of debt and this fear. That's driving adoption. And then people are finding new use cases like NFTs for smart contract stuff. That's creating a technology adoption like anything, like the internet was. And it happens to be the fastest adoption of any technology the world has ever seen, except AI, which has been faster. But we're also finding that that the central banks are debasing currency. They're making our money less valuable. So we're looking for things that are a store of value over time. That's not necessarily against goods inflation. It's against the thing that governments and central banks always do. They clip the corners off the coins until you've got no coin left. That's a way of taxing you without you knowing. And that's to pay the debts that the government has because of the aging population and all the debts out there. So those two things are driving the movement of crypto. So the crypto price is based off those two issues. The adoption of the technology, as everybody's starting to build on this new tech stack, and because it solves a lot of problems. And then it's the thing that the central banks are doing, are devaluing your currency all the time. That creates a super mega trend within this. Now, it as a space is growing on average, including the bear markets, which are brutal, as we all know, it's growing at 100% a year as a space. So there are 516 million wallets as of end of last year, active wallets. If it's growing at 100%, by the end of this year, it's a billion. Then the end of the year after, it's 2 billion. Because So the numbers are vast as people are adopting it. Now, the difference here between this and the internet or the mobile phone is we were users of the internet and mobile phone, but we didn't make money out of it unless you happen to own the right shares. But nobody could own the infrastructure of the internet. Different parts were. Here, 
you can actually own the thing by owning a token. So we're getting to participate in something that has never happened for humanity, which is a global infrastructure being built by everybody around the world at the same time, and we can own a fraction of it. So this is, at an investor level, why, why it now matters to everybody, this is the first global homogenous investment product the world has ever seen that can operate like this. So it's the same product. Bitcoin is Bitcoin in India as it is in Nigeria, as it is in London, as it is in Hawaii. It's the same thing. Indian investors can't take, trade Tesla shares. Yes, they can trade gold, but they don't have access to it because you have to go to the to the to the store and buy gold jewelry, and you've lost a lot of the the markup within that. But here, anybody can get a wallet because it's on the internet, and you can send money home to your mother in the Philippines from the United States instantaneously. And by just owning one of the tokens, an Ethereum token or whatever it is. You've got a share of it. So if more people adopt it, you get richer. This is like one of the greatest schemes the world has ever seen in creating mass wealth, not for Wall Street, but for retail, who got to front run all of this and create a new system that solves the problem of what's the investment, uh, that what the central banks and governments are doing and solves the problem of an over indebted society. I mean, that's how big it is. Yeah, and I just want to add a, a, a few things that you're saying them, but I'm going to be more blunt about it. Uh, the central banks and the politicians have been drunk driving with the money, and the result of which their reckless behavior is eroding the wealth of lower and middle class people, uh, primarily people who are hourly workers. They get their money, it comes in, they have it, uh, but it's worth 10% less in two years, and they've lost and eroded their purchasing power. Something like, like Bitcoin is stable. It's unfettered by the government. Okay, so this is a decentralized system. We don't have to trust anybody but the decentralized na nature of the system. So the facts are we don't trust any central authority because we're all working on it together to make it decentralized. So with that, tell us where we are. Are the rates coming down? Do we have more so, inflation ahead? Is there disinflation coming? So, Raul, where, where do you think the stock market is, et cetera? So let's look at those two component parts, main parts. One was the debt cycle. That's not changing. In fact, the governments are issuing more debt to pay the interest on the previous debt. And that's pushed interest rates up and it's made it even harder. So the debt keeps going up. OK, so we haven't solved that one. And it's just accelerating because we're now having to pay the interest on the COVID um, bond issuance, debt issuance. So it, it's going vertical right now. So we know they're incentivized to con continue this path. On the other side is, are they going to debase the currency? Well, they've been doing the opposite in 2022. Why crypto had such a bear market, as most things did, is they were taking liquidity out because there was inflation. So here we are where if we look at truflation, which is a on blockchain measure of inflation, it's at like 1.4%. So inflation's come down. It's not the boogeyman anymore. Growth, interest rates are too high for that kind of environment at 5.5%. So the probability is they're going to lower interest rates. We're seeing China in an economic mess. They've got a full debt deflation going on. Same issues, aging population, high debts, everything's blowing up. They're likely to stimulate further. The Europeans are likely to end up stimulating further, and eventually the US will stimulate more as well, because they need to get growth to pay for these interest costs. So that is what lies ahead. And then we've got the other sweet spot in the middle of this, which is politicians hand out candy during elections. And the candy that everybody wants is stimulus. So they will hand out stimulus, which needs to be paid for. It either ends up on the Fed balance sheet or some other liquidity measure to allow the government to fund itself. So what we've got is a high probability that our money's gonna be worth less, asset prices are gonna rise, but our wages won't, which is the big problem. So we're, our future selves are getting poorer because we can't afford as many assets. And we've got this massive wave of debts to be refinanced. So that's normally a very positive backdrop 
for crypto. Lots of liquidity. And liquidity is what drives all markets. But crypto is the supermassive black hole that sucks in so much capital when this happens. I mean, it's a mouthful. I, 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 I didn't get it in the beginning, Raul, I, because I went to a classical economic training. You know, I'm going to date myself mid 80s. We were talking about stagflation and the Fed and managing the debt. And uh, what I left school, I think the U.S. government had under a trillion and a half dollars of debt at that time. Uh, we've hyper cycled this debt. And so let's just give everybody this this understanding from George Washington to George W. Bush, seven trillion dollars of debt, which we all thought was staggering. But we're now uh, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Joe Biden. They add $27 trillion of debt, we're at $34 trillion. So, you know, average citizen, bro, explain it. How are they going to be okay? Is the average citizen going to be okay? Can the government get out of this? Will the government just have to print the $34 trillion coin? What happens, bro? So the average citizen's not yeah. going to be okay until, unless they take action. This is why people are angry, whether you're on the left or whether you're the right, you're, you're angry because the system is failing you. And what's happening is you're a wage slave and you can't buy a house or you can't invest as much of the stock market that your parents could do. You just, A, cost of living is high, but B, asset prices keep coming up and that's because they're debasing the currency. And what debasing the currency is, it sounds like a complicated economics term, but what it basically means is they're robbing you of the power to buy assets by, it's been on average 15% a year since 2008. So you're losing the ability to buy assets by 15% a year. So each year you sit in a pile of cash and don't buy a house. That house is roughly going up at 15% a year. That's bananas. You sit on cash for two years or you don't have any savings, it gets more and more expensive. What they're actually doing here is taxing you, but by hiding it. It's like a socialization of all of this costs. But what's so massively unfair is it disproportionately hits people who are wage earners who don't own assets. So you and I, we have assets. And so your assets offset, that maybe your wages, your, your income doesn't rise as much. But for the average person, they clock in, they go to work, they come home. Even if you're a dentist or a doctor or a lawyer, it, you're still in the same boat because your wages are not rising as fast as asset prices. So you're just your future self gets poorer because what an asset is, is, and it can be the same for Bitcoin or gold or real estate or equities, it's a way of putting your savings into something that you can get them back in the future. So it's your future consumption. It's your future life is in those. But you can buy less of them. So your future life is getting poorer. So everybody's getting screwed over here and they don't understand why. Fancy words like debasement come along. It's like, I don't really understand what that means. It means right. they are robbing you of the power to use your wages to gain an advantage for yourself later in life. Yeah, so they... They, they listen, ladies and gentlemen, we don't want to overtly tax you because we want to stay in power and we want to over promise you goods and services that we can't afford because we're not overtly taxing you. So what we're going to do is manufacture debt, a result of which the money that you're earning is going to be worth less. And so it's a form of taxation, this debasement that you're describing, this inflation is an invisible form of, of taxation. And by the way, the, the mystery of why it works, Raul, uh, I believe is because the numbers go up. And so if I'm worth $500,000 and now all of a sudden as a result of inflation, my house is worth seven fifty, I actually feel nominally richer even though I could be poorer. And this is why, this is the great mystery of why it's working for people. Um, because That's, they don't really 100% understand it. No, because you're dead right, is that people don't understand because it looks like their stock market, their 401k has gone up and all of this. But that's only a, a small percent. That's like 10% of the population who have assets. 
And those people are very happy with it. The more assets you own, the more powerful you are, the more assets you probably own, the less likely you are going to call the authorities into question. The average guy working in Cincinnati who suddenly can't make his ends meet and can't buy an apartment, what voice does he have in this? And he's being taxed at 15% a year and has been 15% a year. And he has been since 2008. And he just doesn't understand what's going on. He doesn't know who to blame. So what they blame is one party or the other. And it's not. Yeah. No, it's, 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 it's very sad. Before I go to these questions, because uh, unfortunately with you and me, I could talk to you for several hours and uh, I've got a limited time on the show because people, frankly, uh, they, they like the show. Where, well, that's the feedback, but they have very limited attention spans. But before I go there, yeah, uh, you bought a new car. Okay, did you buy a Tesla? Yeah. Tell me why. Tell me why you bought a Tesla. Then we're going to take some questions and we'll get back to Bitcoin. And of course, I got to ask you about Solana. Why'd you buy the Tesla? I bought two Teslas, in fact, one for me and one for the wife. Um, firstly, I just, I just heard a lot of good things about them. And when I drove one, I was like, this is like a quantum leap in cars. And I've had Ferraris, Porsches, BMWs, Mercedes. I've had them all. Go on this Tesla, I'm like, this was the iPhone moment of cars. It's like, this is so much better than anything that's ever preceded it. And, uh, you know, I look, there's a few nice cars on the island here. It's not full of sports cars because the road's pretty crap. But there's a, there's a Bugatti and there's a few Ferraris and there's plenty of Porsches. My Tesla Model X Plaid is the second fastest car on the island. <laughs> it's a seven-seater. Right. right. It's, they're crazy and they're, they're amazing cars. So I like them and also... I like the fact that I don't have to go to the gas station. All of, we have to import all of our fuel on Ireland. It's, you know, it's expensive. If I can make a green choice, I'll take a green choice every day. Why not? You know, we live in a fragile little yeah, yeah, yeah. nature here. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it's it's, it's interesting. You know, you, uh, you know, I like your moves. I like following you around, Raul. Okay, you got you got. Have you bought one yet? Me up. You got well. I I personally don't own one, but my son worked for Tesla. And he has, I think, two of them and absolutely loves them. And I do think a Tesla is in my future. The problem is, you know, I'm a Long Island Guido and I always wanted to have a Lamborghini, you know, and so I'm have both. holding so out for I've a got, Lamborghini. I've got Iggy Pop's old Porsche. So I've got oh, my gas that. guzzler. I love that. So it's Iggy Pop's yeah. old car because he lives here on Ireland. And I've got the Tesla. Right. It's the perfect balance. Oh, I love that. Okay, before I go to the questions of the outside audience, okay, what does your portfolio look like right now? What moves are you making and what advice for this year ahead for the markets? So my advice is I spend a lot of time, I haven't talked a lot about it, but I spend a lot of time looking at the macro economy and what is going and where it's going to drive assets. And my view is that the issues we've been talking about, printing of money, excess debt, are going to be the feature of the next two years. How do you pay for that? And so therefore, I am very aggressively positioned in crypto because the only other secular trend there is, I can divide any asset like the S&P 500 or real estate or gold by the central bank balance sheet, the Fed balance sheet, i.e. how much money are the Fed printing or putting on their books. And most of them are pretty flat line. Then you look at the NASDAQ and it's going up because there's, we're getting more digital every day. So there's endless demand. And then crypto goes up exponentially, as we know. So the fastest race, a horse in the race is crypto. So I'm actually 100% of my liquid net worth in this. And I have been actually for since 2020. And I use the bear markets to add into because I think we're in a once in a lifetime wealth accumulation opportunity for everybody. Be you rich or poor, you can still put 10% of your savings in as you go. And so, so I that's how strongly I feel about it. It's not just a passing interest. It's not something I say on TV. It's something I actually truly believe in. Okay, let's go to some outside questions, Raul, if you're cool with that. Uh, do, you, do you think if Biden softens his stance on digital assets, it would secure the 2024 election for him? This is from uh, Bob from Texas uh, via email. Thank you, Bob. 
What's your thoughts there? I can give a few thoughts as well. My, my view is that Coinbase has 110 million accounts. They're not all the US. Let's say 50% of the US. It's probably more, of which there are about 12 million actives, and I think that'll go up. So think of those as the voters. So there's a swing vote here of somewhere around 10 to 20 million voters, probably, who care about this enough. So I, yes. that probably matters reasonably. Yes. Uh, you need to look at the distribution of crypto owners. Are they all on the coasts? I'm not sure. I think it's pretty evenly split. So I think it would it would help the Democrats. Um, I think whoever's going to take it, we've seen RFK take it. So that's the, the independent. We've seen um, the right, the, the Republicans haven't fully embraced it. Vivek did, but we don't know where he's going to shake out. Trump's obviously made the <laughs> NFTs he hasn't made the I hate Mooch NFTs yet, but I'm sure they're coming. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I hope he makes those. I'll be buying those, actually. He'll make some money off of me right. if he makes the iMooch. But, but, you know, Trump said in 2018 he absolutely hated Bitcoin. Um, but I think Trump is more interesting than Biden in this way because he has no principles. He's like a spinning weather vane. He'll, he'll go with crypto. This could swing the election. So, Bob, uh, I think the Democrats are making a terrible mistake. Uh Rose being a little bit more polite than me. Let's go to, I the, think, let's I, go to the next I, one. I agree with your point is whoever take, if the Democrats screw this up, I don't think people are going to forget and they, they will vote. Yeah, no question. Okay, so this is for you, Raul, because it's right up your, uh, it's right up the fairway for you. Will there be a super cycle in this full run? This is from Daniel from Florida. Um, how I put it, how I think of it, I think there's a... 60% chance that's just a normal crypto cycle. So Bitcoin finishes 150 to 250,000. You know, it does a few X the last all time highs. There's a 20% chance that because of the ETF and how the bit, how the economic cycle works, everyone gets overexcited about rate cuts, whatever, that we kind of front load it and it's short. But then there's another 20% chance that this actually extends further than we expect because institutions and others come into the space and it broadens out. So I think 60% chance um, normal cycle, 20% super cycle, 20% actually a short cycle, something like that. Okay. All right. Well, no, that's exactly what we're looking for. Let's go to the next question. What's the status of silver and gold bullion? Razik from New Zealand. So look, gold and silver have have always played this role that Bitcoin does. Uh, it always will do. It is a global store of wealth. Gold is probably the world's true gl global currency. Um, but what we're finding is in a digital age, they don't work as well. Because I can send you Bitcoin in a few seconds. But for me to transfer a gold ownership is a very physical process or we move paper rights around, which is kind of goes against the case for it. So gold will do fine in the same environment. It's there to save you. It's just not done as well because it doesn't have this technology super cycle behind it. So I prefer crypto than gold or silver, but they're ways of skinning the same cat, as you say. All right, let's go to another question. If there are more questions, has the central bank fashioned its policy to purposely create and transfer taxpayer funds to the super wealthy. No, they're purposely doing it to stop the assets blowing up. The reason being, our actual problem is actually demographics. There's too many old people. And the old people all own equities. And they also have all the wealth. So if you were to allow the market to go down 70% that people want, you know, we want that bear market to show the bankers that they've done it wrong, we wipe out 70% of the wealth of America. You simply can't do it. And that's the collateral for all of the debt as well. So you blow up everything. That's what we learned in 2008, which was like, they're not going to go there. That was what Draghi did in 2012. It's like, whatever it takes, but we are not going to do that, which is the 1929 right. outcome. So what they're actually right. trying to do is rescue the baby boomers and rescue the governments who are trying to keep economic growth going with an indebted old population. So they're not trying to transfer money to the super wealthy. That was the unintended consequences. I don't think they understood 
what they were doing was debasing right. currency. And when they learned it, they're like, oh, this is magic. Let's just keep pressing the magic button. Assets go up and uh, we're saved from ever a, a debt deflation. But, but, but Craig is on to something because the debasement of currency, the super wealthy own the assets, Raul. So if they debase the currency, the assets go up in nominal value relative to those assets. And of course, then it makes it harder for the non-wealthy who don't own assets. So Craig, Craig, it's not, I think the rule is 100% correct. I mean, these are our opinions, of course. It, is, it wasn't done intentionally, but they painted themselves into a corner in terms of the matrix of their decision making. And they're now pressing buttons relative to what? Their only alternative is to do what they're doing, which is why people like Raul and I own things like Bitcoin. Yep. And so on, to, and Ethereum. to play that out, what if they didn't do it? People say they should just let the markets clear. Okay, so letting the market go down 80% wipes out most of the wealth, the entire financial system. Nobody cares about the financial system. I get it. But the wealth of the retirees in their pension plans, yeah. the farmers, the teachers, the firemen, all of these people, they all rely on pensions. And you're going to take that? They're not, they're not, they're not doing that, Raul. I think, I think we both know that. All right, let's see. Any more questions out there? Let's fire in another question, if there is one. I think the U.S. will start its digital dollar and attach it to natural gas, which we have in abundance, and can supply the world for 200 years. What's your thoughts on this? So this is interesting. Will they, will they use natural gas as collateral for the digital dollar? Um. I don't think so. And the reason being is natural gas is a bitch to store. You can't store it. There's also too much of it. So you keep devaluing it. Because we've got so much natural gas. And that's without taking into account how much Qatar has got. They've got ridiculous amounts. Russia's got stupid amounts. Iran has got stupid amounts. Yeah. There's way too much natural gas to use. The other thing of natural gas is actually it's quite energy inefficient in terms of kilojoules per unit. So it's cheap, but it's not that efficient. So the dollar, the US having natural gas is great because if they can export it, they get money back in. It supports the actual dollar. I don't think anybody wants to peg their currency to a commodity because then your your entire economy is pegged to the ups and downs of a commodity. Okay, I, I, I agree with you. And the only other thing I would say, Tom, is that because the U.S. doesn't control all of the supply of natural gas, uh, this would not this would be a non-starter for the U.S. Uh, and I'm ho I'm hopeful that we won't have a digital dollar. By the way, I think that we have solutions in the stablecoin industry that provide that. Uh, it's not clear to me from the uh, from the Fourth Amendment, the right to privacy in the U.S. that we would want a digital dollar. Uh, any other questions out there? Asking our producers. It's your position on Anthony's neckwear today, Mike and Dave from the control room. I think that's for you, Raul. Look, we're both in the tropics. I've got the bracelets. He's got the necklace. I'm with him. Yeah, I'm, try I'm not trying to make Mike and Dave green with envy. Okay, I bitter. hope you they're are just freezing. Bitter. They're just bitter because they're yes, in, they are. And I hope cold. you are. I hope you are freezing where you are. While Raul and I enjoy the sunshine. Bro, we're going to wrap in a second, but I got to pin you for one moment on some 18 month price targets. Let's start with Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then let's finish up with one of my favorite coins, Solana. So, Bitcoin, where is it in 18 so months? I don't so? like making these predictions because both people like you and I get beaten up over the head with it and said, why didn't it happen? Yes, you said it. I've made, I've, yes, yes I, I, I've made a lot of wrong predictions, which is why I want you to be wrong as well. Misery loves. Misery loves company, Ralph. So as long as people but accept that I am going to be 100% wrong, I'm kind yes. of thinking Bitcoin finishes this cycle closer to 250,000. I think a lot of people are lower. I think it might be higher because of the dynamics of the ETF and other stuff. I'm pegging Ethereum right. between 15 and 20,000. And okay. I'm pegging Solana between 750 and 1,000. Wow. Okay, that's a big move for for uh, Solana. Yeah, so I think it's the relative uh, outperform. I, so my view is Bitcoin right. starts the cycle and outperforms in the start. Then people go out the risk curve. ETH. We're going to have an ETH ETF. We'll see the market pick up there. Right. 
but the horse right. that's moving faster is the one that's coming from a smaller adoption base. It moves yeah. faster. Faster, faster, smart contract network. And obviously my good friend, Anatoly, I'm rooting for him and I own a lot of that. So that's full disclosure. Both are all and I own Solana. Lots of it. Um, okay. Okay. But, but listen, you've been terrific. You got to come back on Speak Up. Uh, we appreciate you being on. And uh, hopefully next time I can do this live in that beautiful home of yours somewhere in the Grand Cayman Islands. But uh, this is Speak Up with Anthony Scaramucci. Raul, thank you so much for joining today's show. Thank you, my friend. And good to see you all, everyone. And you can find me on Twitter if you want to ask any questions. I'm always around. Thank you.